It's okay with you. I'd just like to start with a very high level question. I asked this of all of my guests at the beginning. It's really just a jumping off point. And that's what's your current assessment of today's global economy and financial markets? We're obviously in uh, a very challenging time. Uh, having said that, I'll tell a, a quick uh, anecdote. In uh, the early 1980s, when I went to work for uh, a large bank in the investment department, my boss at the time said, Chris, one day when you're writing regular commentary, as I'm sure you will be, you always want to start with now is a particularly difficult time to uh, provide investment advice. Uh, uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm cognizant that uh, while today looks like a particularly uncertain time uh, when we're assessing financial markets, it's always an uncertain time. <laughs> There's never one who writes the uh, newsletter saying this is the easiest time ever to invest, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, look, uh, just to dig a tiny bit further, when you say it's a challenging time, what are some of the key reasons you say that? Well, um, volatility is elevated. So if you look at uh, the VIX or if you look at implied volatility in bond markets or you look at the deviation of even very safe treasury bond prices from a model of uh, where they should be, we find that uh, we don't have enough liquidity in the system and the risk is elevated. And when risk is elevated and liquidity is scarce, uh, financial accidents are, are, are more common, uh, including uh, you know, large downward moves in capital market prices. Uh, and of course, uh, the macroeconomic environment, as all of the listeners know, resembles nothing that any investor that's uh, younger than me, and uh, you know I'm in my 60s, has any memory of. Uh, those of us who who lived through and were professionally active in the 70s and 80s may remember uh, high and volatile inflation environments, uh, along with uh, geopolitical conflict and domestic political polarization. But you really have to go back 30, 40 years to find a historical precedent in today's environment. There's a lot of big trends that are shaping the financial landscape right now. And I'm curious, what are the biggest ones that you're monitoring and what are they telling you about the future? Um, we, can, we can tackle this in any order that you'd like, but maybe we should start with inflation because that's really been the big game changer over the past year. Um, so I'd love to kind of get a sense of what your outlook is for it. You know, do you see it moderating over the coming months? You know, will the Fed be able to get it back down to its target of two or three percent CPI? Um, or are we in a new secular era of just higher inflation going forward from here? Inflation that we see, make no mistake, was a policy choice. This wasn't an accident. It was uh, a policy choice. And I have great sympathy for the motivation and the intentions that got us here. I think there was a, a big mistake, but mostly just the difficult consequences of responsible actions. So let me uh, explain. The reason we have inflation is that we electronically created lots of new money. And this is a crucial point. We then wire transferred all of that money into people's bank accounts, hundreds of millions of bank accounts in the United States. We injected huge amounts of newly created money, uh, and not just to individuals, but to many corporations as well. Uh, nonprofits, all, all manner of bank accounts suddenly were stuffed full of newly created dollars, and that creates inflation. I could go on in, in macroeconomic theory and talk about MV equals PQ, mm -hmm. but I would just say, imagine your eight-year-old self asking your parents, well, if that's where money comes from after looking at the ATM machine, why can't the government just send everybody $100,000 a month? If we sent everybody $100,000 a month, then we'd all be rich. Well, of course, we wouldn't all be rich because the amount of goods and services that are available to consume isn't increased by transferring money into bank accounts. 
and our consumption is limited by the aggregate amount of production. But what we had was a was a dire uh, a crisis, a pandemic. And in that pandemic, there was a fear, and I think a very reasonable fear, that the human suffering that would result from that pandemic would fall disproportionately on the worst off in our society. And in, in an effort, a humanitarian, well-meaning effort to prevent disproportionate suffering uh, from the those least able to afford it, we distributed lots of cash, lots of new money to everybody's bank account. And it wasn't very targeted because you can't target it. The government doesn't know that much, right? The government can't figure out who are really the people needed it and who are the people that don't need it and just target it to the people who really, they, they don't understand that. So they just wanted to flood everybody with money so that the, the, the people who really did need it mostly got some of it. And then lots of other people who didn't need it also got it. And that's what we did. And it was a humanitarian impulse and I get it. But during the pandemic, we closed down lots of parts of the economy, not just in the United States, but the whole world. So the aggregate amount, the aggregate supply of goods and services was going down. There's no way that we can all not reduce our consumption if the aggregate amount of production has all gone down. So simultaneously with uh, aggregate real production of goods and services declining, we flooded the system with money. That's why we got inflation. And the problem that now we have to deal with inflation and inflation tends to be self-perpetuating. Uh, once you've got it up and going, you know, the uh, uh, prices are going up, fuel costs are going up, cost of food, groceries is going up. Then people expect to have higher wages. Uh, and because people get higher wages, then uh, they can afford more. They can afford more in nominal terms, of course, right? They're not getting more. They're not actually getting more gallons of gasoline. They're right. not getting more groceries. They're just paying higher prices, and that gets some momentum to it. Um, I said there was a mistake, and there was a mistake, and it was the the mistake of the Federal Reserve, and it was this Fed saying, and 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 they and they were very clear about this. We're going to change the way we do monetary. Policy. We're not going to forecast future inflation. And when we forecast that future inflation is at risk of rising, perhaps because unemployment is lower than its natural rate, and, and nobody knows what that natural rate is, just like nobody knows where the equilibrium level of interest rates are. These are uh, a theoretical concepts, not easily measurable uh, quantities. But but the Fed had always been had a forward looking. They, they they have models and forecast where things were going, and then they would act preemptively and ahead of time because, of course, there are long lags in in policy. So famously, the Fed is supposed to take the punch bowl away from the party before party gets too raucous. Well, what the Fed said was, no, we're not going to do that. New change, new policy until we see actual inflation rising, not just a forecast of inflation rising, until we see inflation actually rising well above target and we see employment at risk, we're not going to tighten. So what they did was say, we're going to err on the side of having inflation get above target. And what did we get? They they erred on the side of inflation getting it above target. Now, I want to go back and, and emphasize, don't be too cruel to the Fed, because that was a small part of the deal. The big part was flooding the world with money as the humanitarian response to the uh, pandemic. That's really what caused inflation. Now, uh, you, a next question you might ask is, where do we go from here? And I think people are underestimating the probability of more persistent and higher inflation. You might say, well, look, the Fed got, you know, retired its silly word transitory and everybody gets that it's not transitory. Well, I'll tell you what, everybody gets that it's not transitory except pricing in the bond market. Break even inflation, the bond market's tradable price for where CPI is going to be is, you know, like about two and a half for uh, over the next 10 years, below three for the next five years. Meanwhile, 
Inflation's running at 8%, higher in many countries outside of the United States. Core inflation or trimmed mean inflation or any kind of model you might use to say what's the underlying trend of inflation excluding the most volatile and, un, and outliers is running at five or six. Core CPI, trimmed mean CPI, uh, core personal consumption expenditure deflator, the Fed's favorite measure. These are all running at five or six percent. And there's no there's no downtrend that you can see uh, in the core measures. And so how do you think that we're going to get to two and a half inflation over 10 years or 2.75% inflation over five years when these core measures are running at five or six. It doesn't seem plausible to me. Uh, now, I guess the one plausible answer is we're about to have a huge economic contraction. That's where I was going, but yeah. <laughs> and I think, I think that people are not yet ready to understand that both can happen. You can have a pretty nasty recession and run at higher than 2% inflation for another five years. All right. So sort of a stagflationary recession is what you're saying. I mean, saying. I think we're, we, we, are, we, are, we are not there yet. We're not at stagflation because we have, we're not in a recession. Uh, well, they might, you might come back and people might date it to it. But, you know, the very, very low level of unemployment is a pretty strong indicator that we're not in a recession. You don't have, you know, 3% uh, unemployment with a as a nasty recession. And as a rule of thumb, it's probably going to take about a 1% increase in the unemployment rate to get inflation down from one about by a percentage point. So if you want to get core inflation running at 5 or 6 back down to 2, you're probably looking at 3%, maybe even 4% rise in the unemployment rate. And that's the policy conundrum, right? Is the Fed going to continue to tighten and continue to hold interest rates up? And, and I would say they probably need to take them at least to the level of core inflation, if not higher than the level in core inflation. So, I mean, 5% has got to be the absolute floor that we're going to see short-term interest rates go to, and it very well could take a six or seven percent uh, rate to get uh, inflation to actually start coming down. And then when it does come down, you're going to need to see again. I think most of uh, the macroeconomists that I talk to, former Fed officials, et cetera, uh, that's kind of where they think the Phillips curve is. The trade-off between inflation and unemployment is that you need about a one percent. Uh, increase in the unemployment rate uh, for each 1% decline in, in, in core inflation. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I think we're looking at, you know, the Fed, another 75 per basis point rate hike, probably as we go through 2023, they're going to need to do even more to get inflation down, but then unemployment's going to start going up. Then we're going to see month after month after month after month of jobs numbers with negative growth in jobs numbers, more people losing their jobs than new jobs being created, unemployment right. going up, and then the Fed's going to lose its nerve. The Fed is not going to get inflation all the way back down to 2% because they're going to look at it and say, well, we got a dual mandate and we're not going to force the unemployment rate up by three or 4% in order just to hit this target of 2% inflation. They're not going to do that. And so we're going to get back to uh, sort of Greenspan era, late 80s, 90s kind of monetary policy that was called opportunistic disinflation. So we're not going to force the result of getting all the way to 2% inflation. We'll live with 3 or 4% inflation for a while. And when the next recession comes along, and that naturally depresses inflation a bit, we'll try to lock that in and wait over, I don't know, a decade or two of natural uh, recessions from other causes, and then try to step it back down to the 2% uh, inflation rate. So uh, yeah, we, we're, we're going to have a big step 
change up in inflation. Well, we already have. People just don't recognize that it's not transitory. Again, the Fed retired the word, but the bond market hasn't retired the pricing of inflation as being transitory. Got it. Okay, great answer. So you you basically say, yes, we are more or less in a new secular era. Um, Fed will probably get inflation down to around three to 4%, like you said, and then try to stair step it down over a long period of time, right. using other recessions that happen as sort of the mechanism for doing that. Thank you.